a new way of looking at health and well-being and how you can transform yours. So um, I'll just, uh, we've, we've really covered me, but I'll, just to say, I sort of span both the science and holistic fields. I started out as a very left brain conventional scientist. Um, I was going to save the world somehow, cure for cancer, something like that. Didn't quite work out, got ill in my 30s uh, with chronic fatigue syndrome and had to find another way to get out of that. And so, you know, my journey into a more holistic awareness began. Uh, but, I, the, you know, my interest is in science plus the more esoteric holistic sciences. So I'm going to probably cover both of those today. I've got about 20 slides. Um, so we should be about an hour and then there'll be time for questions at the end of that hour. Um, here's the outline. So we're going to look, first of all, at the immune system, what it is and how it relates to the gut and in particular the microbes that live in the gut or the microbiome. I'm then going to introduce you to germ versus terrain theory and this is really important because uh, most people don't even understand that there's an option of a different understanding. I'm going to look at how stress impacts the immune system and what the stress response system is and how it interacts with the gut. We're going to look at some of the more unusual features of the bioelectric mind and body um, which is really new information some of this is only just coming out now as as physics begins to be adapted and understood within the realm of the human body and then i'm going to finish up with some healing interventions things that uh, you can do with or without other people so things you can do and things you can do with practitioner okay so i thought i'd start happily with a little diagram of the immune system because the immune system is incredibly complex. Even your doctor is unlikely to understand the full depth and breadth of the immune system. It is astonishing. Um, but this diagram I thought was one of the simplest I could find to just introduce the basic components so that you understand in all the different parts. Um, so first of all, Adenoids and tonsils are, are the beginning, really, the top, they're sort of just behind your nasal cavity in the back of the throat. Uh, they tend to be lumped together because they're very close together and they tend to get terribly inflamed and often removed, which is modern medicine's answer to inflammation is just cut it out. Uh, I indeed had mine removed uh, when I was about nine years old, uh, which means I now don't have that first line defense. So and what they do is they normally help to clear the nose and the throat of bacteria and viruses. So if you don't have them, you are missing a part of your immune system. And that does have ramifications. Um, there is also a little uh, gland beneath your breastbone called the thymus. Um, it produces T cells. If you think thymus T cell uh, of your adaptive immune system, and I'll be talking about what that is further on. Then there's the bone marrow, which produces B cells. Think B for bone marrow. And that's also a part of your adaptive immune system, um, but one that most people don't even think about. And then there's the lymph tissue in your lungs. Um, we sometimes call it bronchus associated lymphoid tissue or BALT, B A L T. Uh, and that's useful for picking up bacteria and viruses that arrive from the air that you breathe and transporting it to lymph nodes. And they are the, the little bulbous uh, organs that lie usually in the groin and under your arms, but there are also some uh, down the center line. And there are actually some in the neck as well. This diagram doesn't show those. But the, the point of lymph nodes is to capture bacteria and viruses and sort of store them until such time as they can be killed and destroyed. So your lymph nodes are incredibly important. And then you, there's your spleen, which most people don't even know what that is. And that filters the blood uh, passing through it and takes out any pathogens. So anything that has got into the bloodstream, it filters them out. But probably the most important part of your immune system, to be fair, the one that most people ignore or don't understand, is the innate 
immune system and innate just means it doesn't have to learn it's just it has certain responses that you're born with um, and these lie in your intestine or your gut uh, in particular there is something called payers pouches which are little indentations that line the gut uh, where it kind of monitors what's coming through so it sort of keeps track of the different populations of gut uh, microbes and so actually signals when pathogenic bacteria are beginning to take over so it, it sort of keeps everything in balance and then finally um, the appendix and here's another organ that modern medicine considers uh, superfluous uh, it often also gets infected because our often our lives are very toxic uh, our diets are very uh, carb heavy uh, very unbalanced and so the appendix which normally stores gut bacteria it's like a little sump for extra gut bacteria can also get very inflamed and is often removed so that's a basic idea of uh, the immune system I, actually it doesn't mention skin here but skin is also uh, part of your immune system too and then I just wanted to this is a don't worry this is quite complicated but if you can just take away from this that there are two arms of the immune system there's innate immunity which is what I said it's the bit that you're born with and it actually operates in the first few hours of an infection um, so zero to 12 hours is when the innate immunity kicks in so it's fast acting um, it's very generalized it's anything that is not you so it can react to food it can react to toxins it can react to bacteria um, it has to identify first of all that they do not belong where they are and then it sends out a load of chemicals to sort of destroy whatever the thing is whether it's a, a bacteria or a toxin and then after 12 hours the the other arm of the immune system starts to come in and that's adaptive or learned immunity and here we get the, the b cells and the t cells and i don't want to go into that in too much detail but what you should notice is that um, b cells produce antibodies and t cells produce um, <clears throat> these kind of extra operational they're like the armed forces T cells which actually destroy the microbe I've got a really terrible throat excuse me <coughs> okay so um, but that only comes in after a few days it starts to kick in after you know 24 hours or so and then it starts to destroy the uh, microbe by identifying parts of it that are foreign and that's usually um, called the antigen and what they produce is a sort of thing that fits around the antigen which is the antibody so you'll hear a lot about antibodies and you'll hear a, a little bit about t-cells as well because they're, they're really important at the moment with the uh, covid19 vaccine that's being developed so um so if you just remember that an antigen is the infectious agent and the antibody is the thing that the the body produces to kind of snap onto it to identify it for destruction and um, <clears throat> vaccines tend to actually attack or um, mimic the antigen antibody reaction so what vaccines do is they try and stimulate the body to produce more antibodies um, even if you haven't actually had the infectious organism so they sometimes put in bits of the organism to to generate the antibodies so that's where vaccines interact and notice that they don't tend to interact with the innate immune system and this is a really important point so um, i also wanted to introduce you to the whole idea of germ theory versus terrain theory and this is something that your doctor will have no idea about i promise you so germ theory is the basis of modern medicine and it says that pathogens which are disease causing organisms originate outside the body causing disease and um, they can strike anybody any time so that's that's basically how we are being taught at the moment to fear coronavirus or any 
flu virus at the moment. And, and germ theory was developed by Louis Pasteur um, back in the, I think it was 1780s, don't quote me, but it was something like that. And um, it basically is also known as the infectious disease model. And it says that, you know, diseases are from without and they can strike anyone at any time. And it's ubiquitous in modern medicine, this understanding, and it's the only understanding that we have. Um, but it's causing a huge problem because a lot of modern diseases are not infectious diseases. They are chronic, uh, nutritional depletion, toxicity related, stress related diseases, which do not fit the model. And so the treatments often do not work. Now, if you want, uh, don't take my word for it, but if you want a really fantastic summary of where we are with modern medicine, just catch Dr. Sarah Myhill's book, Sustainable Medicine. She's a UK GP, former GP. She got struck off because she wanted to use nutrition in order to heal people. And she was having such a great result. They decided that that was unethical and they don't want it. So they, they struck her off. But she's, she's still actually working, but she works now as a nutritional doctor. Um, now, terrain theory came about a around the same time another frenchman this time um antoine bechon and excuse me my french is not great I, I would love to have read you this in in french but i'm not going to um antoine came up with the idea that that it's not the disease that's the problem it's the terrain it's the environment that the organism finds within the body which dictates whether you're ill or healthy um, and thus this actually enables us to treat the patient not the disease or the client not the disease so people who come with one disease say diabetes may not have diabetes for the same reasons and so it really takes away this idea that there's one disease one cure we have to really rethink this now um pasteur actually came round to antoine's idea on his deathbed this is uh, how the story goes, he recanted germ theory and said, the microbe is nothing, the terrain is everything. And so, unfortunately, nobody listened. By this point, germ theory had been so well entrenched that it was difficult for um, medicine to kind of change. And, and so we're stuck with germ theory as this uh, overriding understanding. But I'm going to look at terrain theory because that's a more holistic viewpoint and it's actually more effective for helping people retain and regain their health. Because if you look at the patient or the person, not the disease, you can actually intervene in ways that are sustainable and long lasting. If you can improve the cellular health of people, you build the strength of their immunity and you reduce um, the likelihood of infection. Um, ways that you can do that, by the way, is, is to modulate your gut flora. It's one of the main ways that you can actually improve your health. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But it helps to keep us in balance. And so um, if you understand this, then you, your whole idea of disease is totally different. So disease only strikes weakened systems. And I'm sure someone's going to ask me about how come people with no underlying health conditions get COVID-19. And I can answer that. Uh, but let me do my talk first. So um, weakened systems don't always result in overt, identifiable health conditions, at least not initially. It takes many years to form a disease pattern. Um, but just to remember that the gut is the first line defense to any infectious organism from within or without. It's, it's our basic innate system, and it is a large proportion of our immunity. So gut health is absolutely vital to health generally. And um, I just like this little picture, and I included it because it sort of summarizes what I'm saying here. So in germ theory, you kind of, you've got dirty water, which is our environment, and you put a fish in a, in a, little bag and you dip that in the bowl and you say well that's that's how we're going to protect the fish but terrain theory says let's clean the dirty water you know let's just clean the system let's flush out all the toxins let's improve the nutrition so that's a kind of quick summary of what the difference is 
And then just coming then to the gut brain. So it's not, not just the gut as a digestive organ. You really need to understand the gut is supremely um, complex. It has a huge network of nerve endings that end in the gut. Um, in fact, it has its own nervous system, roughly the size of a cat's brain. So uh, I've got a cat who's very intelligent. So if you think your, your gut has that amount of neurons, it's actually uh, a, a brain in itself. We sometimes call it the enteric brain as well. Enteric just means to do with the gut. It's a two-way axis. It's not all brain to gut which is how I was taught biology in school you know that the brain was the control center and it sent all the nerve messages down to the rest of the body and um, so you know the brain was you know controlling everything it's actually the reverse the gut is more sensitive than, than in some ways than the brain is and, and will relay about 80 percent of the information is coming from gut to brain and not the other way around and a big part of your gut is, as I've said, the microbes that live within it. They are a community of organisms. And I've done many talks on this. I won't be covering that in detail today. Um, but the microbiome or microbiota is the term given to this community of organisms which live with us and largely help us to digest our food and um, re remove toxins. And yes, therefore, their health is linked to our health. As I said, it's the site of your innate immune system. And it actually, um, the microbes teach the immune system how to operate. So it primes the immune system as well. So if you were born with poor gut microbes from either you've had a difficult birth, perhaps you were born via cesarean, um, or you had a stressful birth, that affects your gut microbes. Uh, if you weren't breastfed, that's another thing. And so um, you start off with a little bit of a, a you know, disadvantage, really. So um, the gut actually can signal distress or imbalance to the brain via this gut-brain network. Uh, but there's a particular nerve called the vagus nerve, which is part of our uh, automatic or autonomic nervous system, the one that, that does everything behind the scenes that we don't really think about. But there are also other ways it communicates. Um, it produces little molecules, little proteins called peptides. And the microbes themselves have these um, metabolites that they exude into the lumen, that's the interior of the gut, and they also talk to the gut and talk to the brain. So there's this constant crosstalk going on between gut and brain. Uh, there's just some of the things that microbes produce, short chain fatty acids, DNA, ATP, um, the, the important thing is that your microbes actually signal your biological state. They know whether you're feeling happy or sad or stressed or angry, and they change their output accordingly. Um, now, what um, some of those messages do is it actually can signal to the gut that you're under distress, and it can open up the gut cells and make it leaky. Um, you can get extra histamine for one thing, which is a really, you've probably seen if people go into anaphylactic shock, for instance, that's an excess of histamine. It can be really dangerous. But at a lower level, it just creates this kind of leaky sieve. Instead of your gut being um, nicely secure to the inside and the outside, it actually allows things to, to penetrate through. Um, so stress has a very direct result on your immunity because it affects the leakiness of your gut. So stress is a really, really big part of why you feel the way you do. And I will be talking about stress in a little bit more detail. Um, so leaky gut also means you have leaky brain, okay, because they're very, very similar. The, um, the cells that line the gut are very similar to the cells that line the vessels that lead to the brain. So with things like uh, acute or chronic stress, poor food, which you know some of us eat on the go, don't we? And we eat poor food choices, particularly too many carbohydrates. We're, we've all been told fat is evil and we should get away from fat, but fat is actually uh, brilliant for us. And of course, all the toxins in our environment, and I haven't got time to go into those today, but if I say one thing to you, 
um, glyphosate, glyphosate, glyphosate. Okay, it's sprayed on everything you eat, uh, grain-wise. So your gut lining cells are like an internal skin, and this diagram sort of shows you they should be nice and tight normally. The, the cells should actually meet, um, and and not really enable your food to go through into your bloodstream because that's not how it's designed to work but when they open up due to stress um, you get you get food molecules and undigested fragments including bacteria and pathogens coming into the bloodstream and mounting an immune reaction um, and so for some if that's constant you get a really overreactive system which can cause autoimmunity um, stress, by the way, isn't necessarily acute daily stresses. It can also be things from your past which you haven't resolved because the body stores this memory of stress as a sort of imprint. And again, I haven't got time to go into this one. I did cover that in my last talk a bit more on anxiety. But there are things called adverse childhood experiences. So, for instance, birth trauma. Um, uh, having a bereavement of a parent, um, having a chronic childhood illness, these are all adverse childhood experiences. And they, they kind of prime your system to be more responsive to stress, and so it overreacts much more quickly. So as I said, if you've got leaky gut, you're likely to have leaky brain. And this causes a huge amount of issues with inflammation pretty much everywhere in the mind and body. And so the mental symptoms are likely to be things like brain fog, uh, headaches. The absolute classic example are migraines. Nobody mentions toxicity in leaky brain uh, around migraines, but it's, it's one of the classic symptoms. Uh, dementia, obviously that takes a few years usually to, to come in, but it's absolutely a failure of the brain to detoxify. And more common symptoms like depression and anxiety. So these, these do cause mental symptoms as well as body ones. And in order to heal uh, our immunity, we've got to heal our gut. Um, and a lot of that is to actually regulate this gut flora, the microbiome, to restore the balance that we're missing. You know, if you look at um, cultures that eat natural foods, for instance, they have a much greater diversity of gut flora than we do. We tend to eat the same things all the time, all year round. So one of the major ways to modify your microbiome or your gut microbes is via food. Now that seems a really obvious statement, um, but just to say why and how this works is that food is not just fuel. I mean, we all tend to think of food as calories, you know, calories in, calories out, but it's much more than that because colored foods in particular um, vibrate. They have, they have a resonant frequency, which is what we see when we perceive the colors. So food is information, which microbes, being ancient organisms, much older than us, evolutionarily, um, actually recognize and respond to and can change the DNA readout or, of their output. So this is called epigenetics. So um, just thinking about your genes aren't just a sort of blueprint. They, they respond to your environment. And one of the ways that you can change your environment is via the food that you eat. So for instance, eating varied local seasonal plant-based in the main foods encourages microbial diversity. Um, and not eating the same thing all the time is really key. Uh, and that enables the genes to respond to the environment in ways that we've kind of we've adapted to through evolution. Eating carbohydrates should be uh, complex carbs only, really. Things like white bread, um, white flour products of any sort, white rice, are actually huge uh, blood sugar. Um, they, they affect our blood sugar hugely, um, spiking it almost the same as if we ate a teaspoon of sugar. Um, and so to keep your blood sugar stable, which is a really big part of keeping your hormones in balance and your gut working well, you need carbohydrates that have fiber in. Um, you need um, good fats as well, plenty of good fats. So things like um, 
seeds and nuts, uh, coconut oil, sunflower, those sorts of things. Um, you, you basically want foods that have complexity and are as natural as possible so that they're not foods that have been processed. Processed foods are killing us. Um, yeah, just a little note there about short chain fatty acids, which are in plentifully found in things like coconut oil and flax oil. They actually feed the gut lining cells and keep these junctions nice and tight. The other important thing to know is not just what you eat, but how you eat. It's, it's almost more important how you eat. Um, eating communally with, other, with a one or more other people enables you to actually stay conscious while you're eating of what you're eating and how you're chewing. Um, I know personally when I'm uh, not focusing and I've got a packet of crisps or a bar of chocolate or something and I'm just stuffing it in and I'm not really noticing because I'm eating solo and I'm focused on something else usually TV or something on my phone or whatever. So um, conscious eating is a really big part of staying healthy and chewing, you know, how many of us just swallow without really chewing? Um, chewing sets in motion the sal saliva in your, in your mouth, which starts to pre-digest your food. And it also gives signals to your stomach as well to start um, producing various different uh, digestive enzymes. So uh, the other thing is to have a gap between when you eat and don't eat. So um, most people are eating throughout the day for, you know, 16 to 18 hours. And ideally our system was never meant to, to do that. It, it, it's meant to really have a, a gap where you don't eat, usually between sort of 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. Now, some people will say, well, um, I like the five plus two diet, which is where two days you calorie restrict and five days, or is it the other way around? No, that's right. Five days that you calorie restrict and, and two days that you don't. Um, that seems to work for some people, but not all. Uh, it's really important to notice that whatever diet um, that you sort of look at, you, what you're trying to do is actually change your lifestyle, not to have a temporary fix. Um, one of the things I would encourage anyone to add into their into their diet is fermented foods and I don't mean beer um, I mean things like kefir kombucha um, tempeh these are all primarily they're eastern foods but they're readily available in the UK um, and they they basically have microbes in them good good friendly bugs that help stabilize and enhance the diversity of our own because what you need to know is that um, food interacts with the genes via the microbiome in our guts and changes the way we feel and the way we are. So we have this uh, interplay. Um, the other things that kind of make a big difference, exercise, quality sleep and stress reduction. Um, I'm, I'm not going to cover exercise today. It's, it's too big a field and it's not my area of expertise. I am going to look a little bit at sleep and, and how to enhance uh, sleep quality. And I am going to mention again a little bit more about stress because it's such a massive epigenetic modifier. Now you know what that means. OK, um, there is a whole field around um, what they call this interplay between genetics and food. And it's got the lovely name of nutrigenomics. So if you ever come across that, you now know what that means. OK, now I want to move a little bit on to more of the electrical nature of the human and i'm going to start with genetics because i don't know most people learn that genetics is all about dna you know it's the genes and the dna as the code or blueprint for our body function the, mostly through protein but it's really important to understand that the microbiome has its own dna so every little microbe has a little packet of DNA in it as well. And it actually outnumbers our DNA by about 10 to 1, 100 to 1, estimates vary. So the microbes in our gut are so important because they actually feed in information from previous generations to us. Um, and, and so they communicate to our own cells about the state of play in our, in our bodies. And this diagram is just a typical animal cell with, you know, a bit of chromosomal DNA unwound. I'm going to show you a different picture in a minute. DNA, however, is not just a thing. 
it's not just that lovely double helix that you may have seen pictures of. It's not a fixed code like, I don't know, an alphabet that you read and produce words. It's like a shimmering chimera. It's, it's changing all the time um, and it's never static. It's picking up information from the environment actually all the time. And, and that cell, that picture there is actually not very accurate. The reality of cells is that they have little antennae, um, like little wands on the side that, that kind of vibrate and pick up electrical information and transmit it into the interior of the cell as well. So uh, these antennae are picking up information from your environment. That's, that's the bigger environment, but also the rest of your body. And it's changing the way it reads it. So it's affecting how DNA uh, replicates. So actually DNA is not just a double helix. It's a, it's a moving thing. It vibrates. It's a standing wave which vibrates at specific frequencies. And here's the really interesting bit. It has memory, okay? Because anything that has a waveform stores information. That's how we can get, you know, a TV signal or a radio wave. And light interacts with the waveform uh, in the form of biophotons. If, if you had a machine now that could read very, very low light levels, you'd see I have uh, the tips of my fingers would be emanating biophotons. They'd actually be lighter than the rest of my body. Um, we're not quite sure why the fingertips have higher amounts of biophotons. We don't know the answer to that yet, but we know it does, and it might explain why hands-on healing actually affects people in the way it does. Um, but your whole body has biophotons uh, produced from light information in the environment and actually moving around your body and creating these sorts of information flows. So um, you are not just a solid thing. You are a vibrating energy field which interacts with the, the bigger energy field out there. Now, if this sounds like fantasy for you, uh, that's because like me, you were never taught the physics of, of you know, the human experience. And physicists now understand that uh, everything that is, is a field and we interact in a field. And I guess emotions are also part of the field as are, um, yeah, anything we, we encounter, really. Um, if you walk into a room and you feel a good feeling in the room, that's, that's a, a vibration, isn't it? It's a resonance in, in the field of that room. So DNA actually stores info. And our thoughts and emotions affect the way the DNA vibrates um, and switching on and off these, these informational uh, molecules. So love, gratitude, and compassion switches on parts of your genetic code that enhance immunity. So you boost your immunity. Hate, anger, fear. Let's think of a few more. Regret, um, resentment. All those kind of negative emotions shut down your immunity. So, you know, if you're living a life in which you, the majority of your emotions is negative, you're not going to have a great immune system. And it's not just as easy as saying, well, think positively. Um, there are issues that maybe need to be addressed. But it is just important to know that emotions communicate with our DNA and they do so via these uh, ele electromagnetic fields. And it's instantaneous. So as soon as I feel happy, instantaneously, my gut microbes will respond and start producing better and, and more accurate information. And I just wanted to show you what DNA looks like from this view of a vibrating field. If you were to look down a DNA strand, you see it's like ripples in a pond. It, it's a, a, an amazing thing. Um, DNA is one of the most extraordinary molecules uh, in, in many ways. Now, I just wanted to touch on vitamins and supplements because people often ask me, you know, OK, food, you know, yeah, eating seasonally and so on. But are there vitamins and supplements that I need to also take to improve my immunity? Um, vitamins are 
as by definition, substances we cannot make ourselves and therefore we need from food. However, vitamin D was misnamed, right? It, because we actually do make it in the skin from sunlight and it, therefore it isn't a vitamin. It's just too late to change it. It's actually an immune regulator or actually a, a pre-hormone. It's one of the most important molecules in the body. It, uh, vitamin D receptors are on every cell virtually. So it has a multiplicity of different uh, functions in the body. But here's the thing. It needs vitamin K to activate it. Who's, who's ever heard of vitamin K, right? I hadn't before I came across this, right? K for coagulation. The guy that uh, discovered it was German. Coagulation in German was the K. So um, at first it was thought that all it did was make the blood clot, but we, we are now discovering vitamin K is, is much, much more important than that. And D and K work together. Um, we get D, vitamin D, uh, there's a particular form called D3 from sunlight, from certain foods like mushrooms and from supplements, which you may need to take, especially in the winter, because you're not getting much sunlight on the skin then. Um, depending on your status, who knows their vitamin D status? I had to go to my GP and actually demand to have a vitamin D test. And uh, the result was that I was very suboptimal. In fact, they told me I was normal, quote unquote, but actually I was really lacking. And so I've been taking it ever since. And trying to get out into the sun, obviously, when we do have sun. Now, K2 is more difficult. Um, there is a form, don't worry about all these names, they're called MK7, but it mainly comes from animal foods, which is why I was very deficient, because I was vegetarian for 21 years. Um, and fermented foods, well, I never had any fermented foods in my diet. I didn't even know what they were. So if you don't eat animal foods, then definitely add fermented foods into your diet because they, they enhance the vitamin D and make the K work a lot better. Um, uh, bacteria in your gut also form vitamin K from soil. Soil on food, right? What, what do we get in most supermarkets now? We get sterilized, highly washed, chlorine bathed vegetables and fruits. Um, you need some soil on your food. So harvesting your own is, is one of the best ways, you know, growing as much as you can or buying organic and not scrubbing it completely and just leaving a little bit of soil. It adds a huge amount of nutrition to your diet. Now, what vitamin K does, we now know, apart from uh, enhancing vitamin D, is it keeps your vessels healthy, your blood vessels healthy. Soft tissue elasticity is enhanced by vitamin K. It actually takes calcium from your blood vessels where you store it if you've got, you're taking in too much and, and puts it into your bones. So it strengthens your bones and it stops your arteries from clogging up. Um, so vitamin K is just a really brilliant vitamin that we all need in our diets. Um, it increases our energy uh, through mitochondria, which I haven't got time to go into. Um, and insulin sensitivity as well so it reduces the incidence of diabetes so vitamin k is just a wonderful wonderful vitamin um, and it could be the missing link and here's i introduced this earlier why people without underlying health conditions have been suffering from really severe symptoms of covid19 and some people have found it really difficult to recover as well and are getting these long lasting fatigue syndromes um, I have not read anywhere, and I have really researched this, the vitamin K status of those people. I don't think it's even measured. And to me, it seems very logical that vitamin K might be um, the missing link in these people, that their, their vitamin K is very low, so the vitamin D they have isn't being used. And they're getting these horrible syndromes where they get acute respiratory distress. Um, and we know that deficiency is like more likely in darker skinned people uh, who don't get enough vitamin D from sunlight in the UK. But you must have both. You must have K as well in order for it to work properly and to avoid getting too much vitamin D, which can be equally dangerous. Um, other things you could add into your diet to improve your immune system. Echinacea uh, is just one herb, which um, boosts your innate immune system, it actually boosts something called natural killer cells, which blast any microbe or virus that comes in. Uh, it's particularly good for upper respiratory tract as well, that part of the immune system I showed you early on with the, the lining of the lungs. 
medicinal mushrooms. Um, you can actually buy them now as a medicine, not just a food. Things like shiitake, mitakes, um, there are very many different sorts. And they all increase this innate response, which remember is the first line defense and it's more important in some ways than the adaptive system. And now a little note on vaccination. I'm gonna be as balanced as I can be here because you know there are many different viewpoints on vaccination. I don't want to um, be too controversial, but I do have to tell you some of the facts around this. So vaccination is not the same as immunization. Okay, it's often they're talked about in the same breath as if they're the same thing. Vaccination is an artificial stimulant to the immune system, and usually it's formed from extracted antibody material, animal tissue, some, sometimes fetal tissue, um, with things that are added to really provoke the immune response. And these are called adjuvants, uh, like uh, aluminium, sometimes uh, detergents, believe it or not, um, uh, antifreeze, I, I kid you not. Uh, and sometimes in the past, not so much now, a, a form of mercury called timerosol. These are deliberately put in in order to make it as noxious as possible in order to provoke this immune response. And it's injected directly into the bloodstream. Um, and, and it's very quick, isn't it? It goes into the muscle, uh, usually into the muscle tissue. It's not a natural event because microbes don't normally come straight into the bloodstream as you've seen they come via the gut uh, they come via the bronchi um, and so you get a huge amount coming in a very short time into the bloodstream which the the immune system has to then deal with and also believe it or not although vaccines are extensively safety tested in isolation of course they are they are not tested in combination so this is the thing often people are getting multiple doses over various different times and because everybody's individual and our systems respond in different ways and if you've got leaky gut you're likely to have a much much more enhanced response to this and it could be quite um, bad it could be worse than the disease itself so um, we need to be aware of that really and the other factor of vaccines is that they only use the adaptive humoral system so you know we talked about the adaptive system um, they don't actually enhance your innate immune system so they kind of bypass that altogether because that's through your gut and this comes straight into the bloodstream now um, sometimes they're effective sometimes not depends on the nature of the vaccine um, but it has been observed that the disease is often worse than the real thing you know particularly in the elderly weirdly um, although they're much marketed for elderly people, flu vaccines often are, yeah, they make you more susceptible as well to other coronaviruses in subsequent years. Um, that's in the literature. It's not really talked about, but that is there. And, and the other issue is these multiple vaccinations into newborns and children. And it, it's still reasonably controversial because children's immune systems are not fully developed. They're not mature when you're born, they're still learning. They're still learning their environment, as I've said, from mother's milk uh, and mother's secretions when, when they're born. And so uh, children's detox pathways, their ability to get rid of these adjuvants may be compromised and, and therefore they may cross into the blood brain barrier through into the brain if that child has a leaky uh, brain barrier. And so um, that can cause huge, uh, behavioral issues adhd it has been controversially linked with autism um, and i'm as i say i'm not saying vaccinations cause autism of course they don't uh, because many people have vaccinations and don't get autism but it may provoke it in some children depending on their genetics in particular there's a, a gene called mthfr which i'm not going to go into here but that's a uh, a very important gene which kind of controls um, detoxification pathways and your mother's stress when she was carrying you is another really big factor. We're seeing a lot of asthma in children as well rising um, because of stress in the mother. So that's just a, I hope, balanced view of vaccination. Um, some of it's okay, some of it's not. It really depends on the nature of the vaccine and when it's introduced and the nature of the person. Remember from terrain theory, it's the person, not the organism. 
And then I wanted to just quickly look at the stress response. And um, we talked a little bit about stress and I've mentioned that stress isn't just the daily stuff. It's actually a learned response from how you came into the world, how you grew up, um, the kinds of relationships you had with your parents and your siblings. Of course, stress is a normal part of everyday life and we, we do need a certain amount of stress because we need a certain amount of motivation. And, and actually, our mitochondria, which are our little energy factories in our cells, need a certain amount to prime them to produce energy. So that's called hormesis. So we need a little bit of stress in life. But what happens with most of us is that we've got this burden of chronic unconscious stress that we have inherited from our childhoods and sometimes even from our ancestors, from our parents, our grandparents. Stress is transmitted epigenetically down the generations. So these adverse childhood events um, kind of, they accumulate in the body and increase the stress response, which is, it affects the brain. Um, it lowers the threshold for, for a stress response. It's called limbic kindling. And, and you get a huge amount of um, hormones being produced, in particular cortisol. Cortisol is a, the, the very famous stress hormone that creates and to some degree is supposed to regulate inflammation. But when it's continually produced, it becomes very, very toxic indeed. Um, and actually, chronic inflammation encourages pathogens and disease. And it absolutely... Uh, destroys your immunity so um, your stress response which should be this beautiful coordinated neurological and hormonal pathway um, becomes sensitized to threat where there is none and so you see threat in everything you see threat in um, being made redundant for instance having um, a difficult day at work uh, being uh, cut up by somebody in traffic you know you start to become really hypersensitized and your body is flooded with these stress hormones and this can become a conditioned response and what we mean by that is it tends to recur and recur it becomes a habitual pattern of anxiety and stress in the unconscious brain so it's a really big problem for, for immune response when you are under stress and most people are particularly during this time that we've just had where I know Amy and I were just discussing before we started how um, we don't know we don't know when this whole situation is going to end and we don't know how it's going to end and 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 we're having to do things that we've never had to do before and really cope with unknown stresses. So all of us are pretty stressed at the moment, and if we've got a huge burden of unconscious childhood stress as well, um, that's quite something for our immune systems to handle. And. Um, just coming on a little bit now to the nervous system, and I, I mentioned earlier the vagus nerve. Now, I don't know if any of you know where your vagus nerve is, but it's sort of at the back of your neck and it comes down into your lungs and it travels all the way down through into your internal organs. And it is accessible um, on the head, neck and face in the sense of you can stimulate the vagus nerve that way. Uh, it's called the vagus because that's the latin for wanderer because it goes everywhere it goes up and down um, to your visceral organs but also into the um, certain parts of your head and neck including your ears eyes throat and nasal passages um, and it, it basically supplies nerves down into the organs that kind of do the business of living for you you know the ones that you don't have to think about the uh, lungs breathing for you the liver detoxifying for you your gut digesting and it controls such important things as your heart rate um, the nature of your uh, airways so bronchoconstriction or not so a huge link with asthma there and your digestive process as well so if you've got ibs or any form of digestive issues likely your vagus isn't working well it also feeds back information the other way from your organs to your brain and tells your brain how you're feeling. And so if you've got anxiety issues, for instance, it's often because there are signals in your gut and other parts of your, uh, your organs that are not feeling good, you know, you're not getting great information from that. How we breathe really influences our vagus massively. And most of us breathe from the upper chest, 
particularly when you're nervous like me right now, um, where you're breathing here very fast, you're not breathing from the belly and you're not really doing it slowly. Um, breath is one of the major ways to control the vagus and help restore its function. But also the way we stand and the way we walk. Um, and so a slumped posture tends to decrease vagal innovation. Uh, actually, you know, yoga is really good for retoning um, the vagus nerve. And I know I've got two yoga people on here tonight, so I know they'll know all about this. So, um, and other things, you can do a lot of other things uh, like um, breathing, chanting, gargling, tapping, actually just tapping on the head and neck and chest can modify your vagus as well. There are loads of different ways you can tune your vagus. And if you're interested in any of this, do see the book, The Power of the Vagus Nerve by Stanley Rosenberg, which is a great book. It's actually quite user-friendly and gives you a few exercises as well. But it's really the ultimate mind-body uh, connector. So um, a little bit more about bioelectric cells as we come to an end now. So um, nerve cells, you may have seen a model of them. So they're, they're really long, they're elongated, and they transmit an electrical signal a bit like uh, along a wire, you know, electric current along a wire. Um, but uh, they, they, they do it really well because they have like a sheath or a, um, an insulating layer that allows the, the electrical signal to travel along. And it's really about a voltage difference between the inside and the outside uh, or, that sort of propagates along the, the nerve fiber, which allows this information to travel along. And then it hits a gap between one nerve cell and another, and that's called a synapse. And then you have to bridge that gap with a chemical. As far as we understood, anyway, there was a chemical uh, transfer called a neurotransmitter, which was released and then picked up on the other uh, nerve cell, and then the electrical signal would carry along. So that's how we understood it up till very recently. But we're finding new information transmission and then a chemical one is that it's far too slow to explain the complexity of coordination. If you've ever seen a dancer or, or an athlete um, um, making incredibly complex movements, it's actually far too slow, this system, to explain it. And so the modern thinking is that physics is involved here through these bio photons. Remember me talking about light in the body, creating a, a coherence through all of the nerve fibres simultaneously Simultaneously, because light travels very, very much faster than chemicals do. Uh, and that enables the body to actually uh, finely tune itself and be as complex and wonderful as it actually is. And this electrical nature of the body is completely ignored in medicine, uh, apart from one thing, which is when they do scanning, when they scan your brain or your heart, and then they, they do admit that there's an electrical part of that. But generally, in health and healing, it's ignored. Um, Here's, here's a sample of brain waves um, and from gamma, which are very, very fast, through to delta, which is when you're asleep. And um, different brain waves signal to your body uh, different states of alertness. So um, if, if you're really focused on something, you'll be in gamma. I'm probably in gamma beta now, I would imagine, if someone were to uh, analyse my brain. Uh, but alpha, which is the middle one, is our flow state where we feel actually in flow. We feel that lovely balance between being active, you know, awake, but we're, we're calm and we're actually um, responding to our environment really well. And that's a state you actually want to encourage more of. And you can actually create more of that through sound. And, and there's a wonderful healing tool called binaural beats, which I will mention again in a minute. So alpha is the one we want to go for. Um, oh, it's bust again. Okay. And sleep is really important for maintaining good brain function and this lovely electrical stimulatory environment. And just to show you how um, different things change over a sleep period. So core temperature goes down. Um, melatonin goes up over our sleep cycle because it keeps us asleep. Uh, whoops. Ah, that's what's slowing it down. Blue my neck. Right. Um, 
and cortisol which is that stress hormone should go down to enable us to sleep and then it should slowly start to rise over the the night time in order to wake us up that can get very distorted when you're under stress it's really not liking me today so sleep is actually vital not just to give our bodies a break it's actually really important to our brains to heal and restore its function it allows us to process memory emotion and dispose of toxins overnight because the, the the brain actually shrinks overnight and and the fluid it actually drains down into our neck and, and down through our immune system so um the brain can then drain of toxins and we wake refreshed hopefully um through this lymphatic drainage of the brain. So it doesn't happen with everyone, particularly if you're not getting quality sleep because you don't have enough darkness in your room or you're too stressed. Um, and usually this, uh, the cycle of sleep sort of repeats itself. Dream sleep to non-dream sleep repeats three to five times during the night. Um, and if you don't get enough of these sleep cycles, you wake feeling unrefreshed and you actually start to get inflamed your body will start to get inflamed children need an awful lot more um, than, than adults do and it's important to note that you can change your sleep quality by, by maybe changing the temperature in your bedroom reducing the light because light now is so artificial and it's everywhere and uh, wearing a mask or blackout curtains can really help and switching off blue lights um, are, you know after 9 p.m not looking on screens hopefully we'll all be done by 9 p.m um, because it switches off that melatonin signal which is what sends us to sleep so it can make us hyper aroused and uh, alert and that's not a good thing no that's doing it again hmm. okay uh, Now, one major problem at the moment is the EMFs. And of course, you're all watching me online tonight, so it can't be helped. But Wi Fi is one of the most difficult things our body is having to adjust to at the moment, particularly as 5G is coming in. And again, I'm being, uh, I hope, very balanced about this. Um, 5G is a huge leap in terms of the uh, frequency of the radiation, and our bodies have never had anything like this and it's going to be everywhere and because it has such a, um, a low penetration we're going to have to have a lot more towers um, in order to uh, feed the signal into all the homes for these smart devices that we're all addicted to um, but there is also the common electrical uh, things like uh, microwave ovens and uh, dirty electricity from poor insulated um, sockets and so on we're in uncharted waters right now. We really are. Nope. Okay. Um, so the problem is they haven't been safety tested. And I'm going to stick with this. Um, and especially cumulatively. So nobody really knows how these things are going to impact altogether. We do know that um, EMFs affect your immune system. They affect your heart in particular, um, causing sometimes arrhythmias. And some people are more sensitive than others. But they also affect the earth um, because the earth has biorhythms of its own. And it actually has a, a, a 7.83 hertz vibration. And it affects your vagus nerve, which, as I've previously explained, is a really important part of your health and well-being. So there's all sorts of things that it does. I won't go into that now because we're, we're running out of time. Um, so just as a summary, then, um, healing your gut and increasing your immunity is, is all about uh, actually enhancing the the immune system interface between you and your environment and that's largely to do with your gut and healing involves more than changing just your diet or lifestyle it, it takes into account everything that you are everything that you feel and think and, and so you've got to look at your emotional life as well and healing that because your emotions have a resonance and so in order to engage a full healing response you have to look at your emotional 
stresses. And that's a big part of what I do when I work with people. And our next one, um, I just want to introduce something that I'm just getting into uh, and I'm starting to introduce into my healing practice with people is using the electromagnet electromagnetic nature of the human being. Uh, we need to understand that we're more than just molecules, we're more than just matter. Um, modern medicine ignores this completely. And so uh, you already know that touch is important, you know, how lovely to have massage or, you know, craniosacral therapy, for instance. Um, smell, aromatherapy is really powerful and sound and light also actually impact on us. They're all modifiers of health. But we're getting now to the point where new technologies are coming in and enabling us to intervene much more specifically. And certain bioresonance devices, like um, I've, I've recently purchased a device called the Danus um, bioresonance handheld machine, it looks like a little mobile phone, um, which I'm just investigating at the moment and seems to cure all manner of um, problems with digestive system, nervous system, um, skin and connective tissue. It is really extraordinary. It em emits very low frequency um, uh, pulses. But things like infrared sauna, for instance, which anybody can do, um, are also really, really important. All of these things are powerful when done on your own, uh, but they're all enhanced, I think, by working with a therapist. And um, I guess that kind of neatly brings me on to <laughs> my last slide. So I can find it. So, as you know, if you missed the beginning, um, I came from a science background and now I've sort of moved over to the dark side, or I like to think of it as the light side, actually. Uh, and I'm using different tools now to help people regain their health, looking at a sort of bespoke mind body approach. So I use things like tapping, which directly stimulates the vagus nerve. It also engages the brain um, because you, you, you say things while you're tapping. It may sound really weird if you've never done it and you think, how can that make any difference? But I can absolutely tell you it does. Um, I use also eye movements. Uh, EMDR is a new technique that's coming out, really, really good for trauma um, and nutrition and energy healing as well. So my approach really now is to take the person, not the disease, to enhance using all the methods available to increase not just your immunity, but your health span. In other words, not just make you live longer, but make you live well. That's the whole point, because healing is about coming back into wholeness. It has the same derivation wholeness and healing and as you probably remember from the beginning um, I'm using these approaches now specifically in chronic diseases like chronic fatigue post viral syndromes which we're seeing a lot of from COVID-19 um, but I've been working with chronic fatigue syndromes and post viral work for a long time now and I, I particularly look at um, uh, somatic work so I work through the body to help you heal um, trauma or unresolved emotions. So that's me. Um, I think that's my lot. I think I've just got a thank you one. There we go. I'll see if I can put that up. There we go. Um, so I've actually written, yeah, I need another one. I've written four books now. Uh, the first one was The Scar That Won't Heal, which was on trauma. The second one was about the microbiome, the world within. Then I looked at cellular health and aging losing our minds and then the final one which isn't coming up is life illuminated and that's got more of the bioelectric stuff in so um any questions please do ask amy if you have any or if anyone can think of anything and they want to ask me please go ahead first up i just want to say a very big thank you from um me at Oxo books and obviously from everybody else i'm going to unmute you all very very quickly so we can give um trisha a big round of applause oh. <laughs> Thank you. you didn't unmute everyone, but it's all right. Thanks. Hooray. A few. So I'm going to put you all back on mute again, just so just so we can hear everything. Um, there we go. Yeah, absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you so much um, for being so generous with your time and also with all of your knowledge as well covered so so much stuff in such a short period of time really i cut, yeah. I cut loads out but. 
<laughs> next time, next time we'll get it all, we'll have it all in. Um, mm. We have had some questions, which I'll do my best to get through. Okay. Um, the first question was right from the very beginning um, from Jill, which I will just scroll up and find, saying, uh, is it possible to avoid glyphosate um, and what can we do to minimise its negative effects? Well, it's impossible to avoid it altogether unless you live in a bubble. Um, but you can minimise it hugely by avoiding uh, grains, particularly non-organic grains, um, and also enhancing your detox capabilities. So, um, you know, actually using certain supplements to enhance your detoxification mechanisms. I mean, that's far too much to go into here, but um, glyphosate has been renamed, I believe. It was called Roundup, and now it's called something really weird, which I can't remember, which makes it sound very benign. Because the company that produced it, Monsanto, have been bought out by Bayer, a German company, and they've renamed Roundup and called it something really, I wish I could remember, but it's something like Life Wave or something, which makes it sound really lovely. Um, but it's the same product. And, you know, for years I was using life as a, as a weed killer because um, I was a gardener and imbibing it, inhaling it, telling all my clients it's safe because it denatures when it hits the soil. But unfortunately, it, it, um, it actually affects your microbiome hugely. It, it replaces glycine in your gut. Um, it's a poison and it, it doesn't denature that easily. It's actually persistent in the soil. So um, the, the, the politics of that I can't go into. I haven't got time here. But, but to basically avoid non-organic pro produce and cut, cut down the amount of wheat you're eating because even in Europe, which isn't as bad as the US, the US has a far worse problem with glyphosate than we do. Even in Europe, it's certainly uh, around. Um, and you just you basically have to accept you're going to have some in your body, but you can help yourself by promoting liver detoxification. So if you look that up online, you know, enhancing your liver really helps. What, was that the whole question? I can't remember all of it. You know. uh, let's have a quick look. It was just scrolling all the way back up to the top. Um, yeah, so is it possible to avoid glyphosate and what can we do to minimise its negative effects? Yeah, I think I've covered that. I think you have. Um, we've had another question um, from Lily Houston, who has asked, what are some everyday practices that can help improve our immunity? Well, um, I, would, I would say breath work, you know. Um, breath work is wonderful because it's so simple, you know. Um, maybe combining that with a meditation pro practice or some form of mindfulness, um, eating well but not too much you know making sure you don't eat between the hours of say eight and eight um snacking over you know late on in the evening is a real no-no for the body it, it puts stress on your liver um, which takes away energy from your immune system because your immune system takes a lot of energy to maintain itself as you'd imagine so there are certain simple practices like you know exercising gently every day if you can but certainly three times a week and enhancing your sleep, of course, which I, I did come into, um, making sure that you're getting a good amount of sleep and not just that, but you're getting the quality. And there are various devices now, wearables that you can, there's the Aura Ring, which will tell you how you slept and, and maps it to your phone and will tell you and show you your sleep pattern over the night, O-U-R-A, Aura Ring. Um, so you can, you can, there are various ways you can do this, but the main thing I would say is look at your stress, you know, because that's the thing that I deal with. And I, I didn't even know I was stressed because it was so normal for me to, know, to feel this way. That, you know, high anxiety becomes a pattern that you just accept as normal. And it wasn't until I got ill and the, the doctor said to me, you know, you're always this anxious. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm not. Uh, so, yeah, dealing with your stress as well, you know, getting help if you need to, and having certain techniques. Mm. We've had um, a couple of people actually asking if this entire um, talk will be made available um, and I have recorded it. So I've said that I'll let you check it, Trish. Um, and then if with your say so, we can send it out to people on request. Yeah. Um, and the same with slides. I'm happy to send that out to anyone. Yeah, happy to them. provide the slides as a PDF. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, this information needs to be out there. 
I am not precious about my information uh, because I think the important thing is the more people that know, the more people can spread the word that there are, there's more than just passive waiting, you know, to get ill. We can do things, we can intervene. And, and that's what I, I want people to know. Um, we've had a question from Marianne Hayes, who is asking, uh, do you have any insights into chronic Lyme disease? I'm interested about that as well. So Yeah, I'm not a Lyme specialist, um, but given everything I've said today, that it's not the bug, it's the terrain, okay? Lyme is very complex because it, it has um, various different forms of the organism that, that sort of become quite entrenched and it's very difficult for the immune system to isolate and eradicate the organism, Borrelia. Um, but you have to look at why you were susceptible in the first place. And again, there is a huge correlation between Lyme and glyphosate, massive correlation correlation is not the same as causation by the way it doesn't mean glyphosate causes lyme disease it means that it weakens your immune system in specific ways that allow the lyme organism to kind of come in and proliferate in your system um, as i say i'm not a lyme expert but i would say you know you've got to look at detoxification you've got to look at um, certain nutrients and your stress again same answer really Stress is a massive component as to why people get infected in the first place and why it perpetuates and doesn't get better. Fantastic. I think that might be all of the questions. Um, I just wanted to say it was really great that you brought up tapping because I know quite a few people actually from quite a long time ago that um, said, yeah, you know, I found it's been really helpful. And as a teenager, I was like, what what's yeah. tapping what's all that about but it's 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 sort of hugely prevalent now i think more so than it was a little while ago really interesting to hear you bring that up yeah it's one of my primary tools and if you just said to me 10 years ago you'll be doing this with people you know and even though i feel this way i'm you know i'm learning i'm loving myself blah 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 um you know, I'd have laughed at you because I just said, well, what could that possibly do? Um, what tapping seems to do very directly is it stimulates your vagus whilst also engaging your, your limbic brain. Your limbic brain stores everything for you, all your memories, everything that's ever happened to you. And, and it's about resolving those things through the body. And that's why tapping works. It's much, I think, much more powerful than CBT talk therapies, which kind of, skirt around the issue they tell you why you feel the way you do but they don't change the way you feel eft does that really really quickly it stands for emotional freedom technique but otherwise known as tapping um it is brilliant with children um who by the way you know don't have preconceived notions so you know this isn't just placebo this isn't just because you think i'm going to do you any good children are just doing it because you're telling them that they think it's a bit funny it's a nice game and it still works so um i do think uh, it's very powerful and i love using it but i do it in a very particular way which i haven't got time to go into but i've got a, a particular protocol that i'm now uh, using which involves being really authentic using your own words and swearing sometimes and getting really in touch with your emotions you know because it's so vital uh, to feel what you feel, you know, because so many of us don't. Yeah, to totally feel that. Um, it was. I also thought it was really interesting that you brought up um, uh, the um, thing of traumatic experiences being passed down families as well, because that's something oh, yes. that I'd, I'd read about and hadn't really thought would be spoken about today um, in terms of uh, Holocaust um, yes. victims and sort of the children and grandchildren um, actually sort of carrying that trauma despite not having experienced that experience. It actually has been demonstrated to transfer at least three generations, we think possibly even more, through this epigenetic effect on your stress response. So the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors actually have a, an enhanced stress response even if they've had a really stress-free life. Because, because the genetics are such that um, it's kind of transmitted through your microbiome and also through your mitochondria. I didn't have time to talk about that, but mitochondria are these little energy factories in your cell and they are inherited through the maternal line. They don't mix with mother and father like normal genes do. Uh, and so there is a mitochondrial link from your mother and your grandmother and, and so on as well. 
a mother is really important for us in terms of who we become because attachment to mother uh, teaches our brain whether we're safe or not that's a whole nother talk which we'll invite you back for absolutely there's, there's so much stuff to uncover there isn't there it's just yeah it's absolutely. fascinating I, I love i love this whole mind body thing i mean but anyway we ought to let people go <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all of the questions. Um, there have been lots of really positive comments as well, which has been lovely. People sort of really wanting to see um, the, you know, the presentation again. So I will send over that link to you when it's when it's Thank been played, you. and we'll um, we'll send it out to anybody that wants it. So all you will need to do is drop me an email at info@octoberbooks.org, um, which I think you can do via your Eventbrite ticket link as well. You can literally just reply to that email, and I will get that straight away. Um, and we can send you out the slides and, and all of that jazz. Um, so if there's no more questions, I just want to say a very, very big thank you again to Patricia Warby for her talk this evening. And also a very, very big thank you to all of you for coming. Really, really appreciate it. Um, and if you can support your local independent bookshop, October Books, we'd very much appreciate it. Thank you very all much right. for coming. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. 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 That was really good, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. Thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate it. Yeah. That's, where are you based? In um, Southampton? Yeah.